Good evening. This is Chairwoman Julie Hen. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, September 27th, 2022. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Ms. Roa Hassan. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held in person and virtually and broadcast online through Microsoft Teams and through BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is consideration of the September 27th agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Madam Chair, there is one change from one board member. Thank you. Ms. Hen, this is Ms. Causey. Yes, Ms. Causey. I move to add agenda item F, new business, consideration of supplemental budget allocation transfer to fund additional employee compensation. Original agenda items will be retained and relabeled. Thank you, Mrs. Causey. Is there a second? Second, Stileski. Thank you, Ms. Delusky. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Delusky? Yes. Ms. Jose? Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Abstain. Ms. Scott? Abstain. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. May I have a vote count, please? Favor is seven. Thank you. The motion carries. The revised agenda is approved and the agenda stands. Yes. Thank you. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice, and nine, collect, conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The minutes of the closed session and information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that I call on Ms. Anderson. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Hen, Vice Chairman McMillian, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, and certificated appointments. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in Exhibits D1 through D3? So, so moved, Stileski. Second, Stileski. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Ms. Jose? Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. 
Madam Chair Hinn, Vice Chair McMillian, and members of the board, I am bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. Manager, Office of Staff Relations and Employment, Employee Performance Management. Second position, Student Conduct Hearing Officer, Office of Pupil Personnel Services and Responsive Student Programming. And finally, Coordinator, Office of Pupil Personnel Services and Responsive Student Programming. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit E1? So moves to Lasky. Do I have a second? Second, Hager. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jalesky? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Dr. Williams? Sure. Our first appointment is uh, Joelle Bilski as the manager of the Office of Staff Relations and Employment Performance Management. She is attending tonight with her husband, Randall Bilski. Please stand. We can acknowledge them. She brings 28 years of service to Baltimore County Public Schools. Currently, she served as the supervisor in the Peer Assistance Review in the Office of Peer Assistance Review. She has had uh, several positions. She served as a human resources officer. She also served as assistant principal at Old Court Middle, Sparrows Point Middle, as well as special ed teacher at Stimmers Run Middle and Dundalk Middle. Congratulations, Joelle S. Bilski as our new manager. Next, we have James L. Gordon, who is attending tonight as the Student Conduct Hearing Officer in the Office of Pupil Personnel Services and Responsive Student Programming. Currently, he serves as, served as the principal at Koneka County Junior High School in Koneka County Schools. He brings over 11 years of service as a principal, six years as an assistant principal, uh, teacher for six years as a physical education teacher and special ed teacher. He actually served one year in Baltimore County at Woodlawn High School. So welcome back to Baltimore County Public Schools. <laughs> and next we have watching virtually is Erica A. Hamlet as the coordinator, the Office of Pupil Personnel Services and Responsive Student Programming. She brings 25 years of service in Baltimore County. She currently has served as a pupil personnel worker in the Office of Pupil Personnel Services and Responsive Student Programming. Prior to that, she served as a teacher guidance at Dumbarton Middle School, Weinert Elementary School, and Featherbed Lane Elementary School. She also has had prior experience at Johns Hopkins University. Congratulations, Erica A. Hamlet. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Williams, and congratulations and welcome. The next item on the agenda is the report on board policies. Oh, thank you, Ms. Gover. Uh, thank you. I apologize. This is the new item that was added by Mrs. Causey, which is... Um, the supplemental budget appropriation. And for that, I call on Ms. Charlie Green and Mr. Hartlove. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Board Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, Dr. Williams, members of the Board of Education. I'm here tonight with Mr. Chris Hartlove uh, to submit for your approval a budget allocation uh, transfer. As was noted earlier, this is to fund employee compensation packages, which were announced today uh, during a press conference in coordination with the County Executive, County Council, and Board leadership. At this time, I turn it over to Mr. Hartlove. Yes, and the, uh, the supplemental uh, uh, budget appropriation that you have in front of you uh, basically funds the uh, second, uh, the first half of the year for the 3% COLA and the, additional, and the additional step, the total amount of the, of the uh, 
transfer or the uh, appropriation is uh, $33.4 million spread over the categories that uh, where, where those salaries are being paid. Thank you. Board members, are there any questions? Okay. Hearing none, may I have a motion to approve the supplemental budget appropriation transfer as a presented? So moved, Stolesky. So moved, Offerman. Thank you for the motion, Ms. Stolesky. Um, Mr. Offerman, thank you for the second. Any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Ms. Jones? Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you both. That brings us to the next item on the agenda, the report on board policies. This is the first reader for these policies. And for that, I will present as chair of, or vice chair of the policy review committee for Ms. Lily Rowe. Members of the board, the policy review committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's recommendation to amend board policy 8500, internal board policies, evaluation, board self-evaluation, and Board Policy 8501, Internal Board Policies, Evaluation, Superintendent Evaluation. These policies are presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit F. I'm sorry, Exhibit G. Uh, may I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the Board's Policy Review Committee for Board Policies 8500 and 8501? So moved, Hassan. Thank you, Ms. Hassan. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who registered to speak to attend in person. Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Board um, speakers are selected randomly using an electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Of course, if fewer than 10 registrations are received, all who registered will be permitted to speak. However, no speaker substitutions will be allowed. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask speakers to observe the three-minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the tone or see the time has expired. The microphone will be mute, turned off at the end of your time, and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education Participation by the Public. I now call on our advisory and stakeholder group leaders to speak. Our first speaker is Cindy Sexton with TABCO.
Good evening. Good evening, Chair Han, Vice Chair McMillian, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. TAPCO is relieved that our compensation for this year has been resolved and our members are no longer up in the air. They deserve the certainty of knowing what their salary will be for the school year. Through the advocacy of our members, we have more than doubled the initial offer of a 3% mid-year COLA and one STEP. The 3% COLA retroactive till July, the STEP already received, and a makeup STEP as well, the bonuses for educators at the top of the scale and retention bonuses for all are all a step in the right direction to help us retain our educators. I must acknowledge the opportunity that was missed to make a historical difference in our salary scale. However, all the stakeholders, the county executive, Dr. Williams, and the school board have made the public commitment to finding a way to say yes to the restructuring of the scale, thereby increasing our career earnings. This is one crucial step in recruiting and retaining educators for our students. We will continue the conversation for this. We must continue to work collaboratively at the table with all the decision makers to have a quality educator for every student in Baltimore County. We look forward to these continuing conversations. Our educators work so hard every single day for our students. We must do all we can to show them that we support them and we want them to not only remain in the profession, but also in BCPS. Our students deserve that. Thank you. Thank you. Our next stakeholder speaker is Alyssa Alonzo with the Central Area Education Advisory Council. Welcome. Han and um, Vice Chair McMillian and Board of Education members. I'm here to introduce myself to you. Um, this is my first time being able to come here in person. I left my toddler crying and screaming, <laughs> not wanting me to leave. But I wanted to come in person to introduce myself. I'm the new chair of the Central Advisory, um, Central Area Education Advisory Council. Our council is made up of volunteers who care a lot about our school system. Um, and who are part of the BCPS community. I myself am a mom to a middle school student, two elementary school students, and one who will be in elementary school in a few years. Um, I'm also luckily you know, able to be a member of our PTAs and volunteer from time to time in our schools. I understand that, as, that the CAEAC plays two main roles. First, as an advisory, counts, advisory um, council for the Board of Education, but also as a liaison to our community. And so I'm hoping that we can fulfill these two roles. I think that the two roles cannot be separated. Um, what we're going to try to do this year is learn more and reach out to our community more to understand what their needs are. And I plan to, um, and we have a number of topics this year lined up based on feedback from our community, including kids' nutrition, IEPs, and special education. We're still looking for more topics, and I hope that uh, members of our community will reach out and let us know what they want to hear about and what they want to discuss in our meetings. I'm hopeful that I can serve our community in a positive way and look forward to this new year. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak. Thank you. Next is general public comment, and our first speaker is Yassine Sheikh. Good evening. Good evening to um, everybody in attendance and uh, the chairman, vice chairman, and the board. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Islamic Society of Baltimore. Um, we're a mosque located in Windsor Mill near Security Square Mall. And we serve an extremely diverse community made of many cultures and languages. I am the current imam and uh, one of my roles is um, outreach and community development and uh, engagement. And as part of our outreach efforts, um, we want to prioritize building and fostering key relationships in the community. Um, our primary concern as educators, parents, religious leaders is successful growth and development of our children. And we firmly believe that it takes a village to raise a child. 
So in the recent year, I just wanted to share some of the things that we've been doing, some of the initiatives that we took at the um, Islamic Society of Baltimore. As the head of outreach and community engagement, I reached out to numerous schools nearby, the mosque, and received a positive response from three elementary schools. And after visiting with them, we established a, a relationship of uh, exchange and being a resource for the school. So one in particular, for example, uh, um, Chadwick Elementary School, which is a Windsor Mill, um, you know, there's a community school facilitator there, and you know, we, we built a good relationship where I'm going to be able to assist her in um, a listening session for um, refugee fathers, many of them being Muslim. So it's a good way for us to connect with the school and be a resource for the school for any issues that are related to Muslim students, any concerns that may arise, and um, for us to just um, be there for our schools because we believe they do a great job in educating our children, and we have a key role to play in, in helping them, assisting them in, in delivering that to our community because we want to collectively raise the next generation of, of good citizens and good, good human beings. So I just wanted to share that, that sort of work that we're doing at the mosque. We, we also run our own school at the mosque as a private um, faith-based school. So we're, we're concerned about education, of course, and, and there's numerous services that we provide our community, and one of them is trying to help our public school-going children as well. Well, thank you for, for listening and giving the opportunity tonight. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Take care. Thank you. Our next speaker is Timothy Getz. Good evening. Good evening. <coughs> the mics. Uh, good evening, members of the board. Uh, my name is Tim Getze. I have three children in BCPS. First off, I'd like to commend uh, how BCPS and staff handled the situation at Pine Grove uh, Middle School. It was worrisome for everybody. Uh, the communication that happened during that event was good. Is very uh, well received and, and the follow-up that occurred later on in the day was also appreciated. A um, little constructive feedback. I know some schools were closed due out of an abundance of caution. Um, to me personally, especially since my kids attend a school, it, it leads me to believe that they're in some sort of risk or whatever, but when I talk to uh, some other parents that are sort of, or teachers that had their foot on the ground, it seemed like that was because of uh, other reasons, like uh, police shutting down roads or whatever. So just ask for a, uh, just be honest, that's all. And the people can accept that. Um, the public comment ends with these statements will be provided to the staff and staff will respond. I mean, to my knowledge, I don't think staff has ever responded to any of the public comments that have been provided just be good to have some feedback there. Um, as far as the uh, the restriction to the, these meetings, I sort of don't know why it exists. Um, seems like it should just be wide open. Um, Joe Biden's declared that the pandemic is over, so I think we should adopt that strategy. Um, as you know, math and reading and other proficiencies amongst the students is rather poor, is not heading in the right direction. I think there's a national study that came out that it dropped like five points or something. I don't know the exact math, but I'm sure you're all aware. Um, looking for something to move forward, something that could like leverage or improve the curriculum or the process of learning. Um, in Financial institutions, you conduct like a, a zero-based budgeting process to ensure that there's no waste or fraud. Why can't that be applied to the curriculum? Looking at stuff where we're failing, start from the ground up and say, is this really working? Um, lastly, it's, it's great to hear that the teachers' union, the budgetary issues have been resolved, but what hasn't been resolved is the disciplinary problems that are in school. I know there seems to be a lot of push or direction to say, well, that's the admin school's problem and, and they need to handle it, but there, there needs to be something more. So I've called upon this before, and I'll call upon it again. Suspend the equity committee, turn it into a school safety committee, and show that this board means that. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jean Nichols. Good evening. Good 
needs advanced preparation for change in routine. Teachers and staff probably know this phrase well. It is one that often appears on IEPs and 504s of the students I support, and I often joke that if I had an IEP, this phrase would appear on my document as well. But I am an adult, and as such, I roll with the changes as they inevitably come my way. But there is a limit. Last year, my schedule as a paraeducator changed eight times over the course of the school year. By the end of the year, I had gone through a, tour, a thorough tour of the building, supported in classes and programs that I've never been in before, and I experienced all four of our lunch shifts. Off kilter is a good word for how I felt, learning how to work with new students, new teachers, and new content. I can only imagine what students I support felt like every time I wound up someplace new. This year, I feel off kilter in a different way. Many of the teachers I work with are new, either to the building or to BCPS entirely. And with this rush to onboard new hires, there are bottlenecks and processes that allow teachers and support staff to transition seamlessly into their new positions. Imagine being a new teacher, being onboarded, fingerprinted, and ready to work, but not having logon credentials or a BCPS computer. Imagine only getting those vital credentials halfway through your first week with students with no ability to familiarize yourself with a new learning management system and unfamiliar instructional tools. I work with those teachers. I support those teachers to the best of my limited ability. And I have to ask, how are we ensuring our newly hired educators are able to be their best selves if they start off behind the curve? Imagine being a paraeducator who has been hired to work for the school system but is unable to set foot in their building because their background check has not gone through yet or because they have not yet been able to make an appointment for their physical. My first schedule change of the year occurred due to such an issue. And I have to ask, how long of a wait is acceptable? When does a new hire just give up and find a position somewhere else? Imagine being an employee who changed positions, got married, got divorced, or gained an advanced degree, who needs to document change in status so that benefit and pay are accurate. Imagine having to send multiple emails or having to call multiple times to get a response or a confirmation of status change. All of this makes us feel off kilter. I acknowledge that some bottlenecks are not within BCPS's purview. Fingerprinting and background checks take as long as they take, if as long as they're filed. But other bottlenecks are foreseeable. And as educators need support into, in order to fulfill their duties with fidelity, so do central office staff. It goes without saying that if there is a large influx of new hires, there is a lot that needs to go on behind the scenes in order to onboard everyone successfully. It is clear that these offices are overwhelmed. Can they please get the support that they need so that the entirety of BCPS can be its best self? Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mohammed Jamil. Mohammed Jamil. Good evening. Good evening, peace and blessings to all. I've had the opportunity a few times in the past to observe the workings of the calendar committee. The first observation was that it was a nightmare of juggling and considering many, many factors and limitations to arrive at the 180 days, years, or 1,080 hours school days. It was a Herculean task, and worse, if any change were to be made in its, in its successive years. Therefore, we realized that the resistance to make any change to include the closings of the schools on the two Muslim holidays was a dilemma for the calendar committee. Maintaining the status quo appeared to be the goal to prepare the school calendar year after year, with the two holidays for another minority already fitted in automatically every year. In our view, the continual denial of our requests for such inclusion was based on subtle bias against Muslims, period. 9-11 raised it 
to the level of a conscientious or subconscious bias. The first loud and clear decision against Muslim students took place around the same time when a Muslim high school student from Woodlawn High was framed for murder of one of his classmates. He was sentenced to 30 years in prison. Many appeals against his wrongful conviction were rejected over the last 23 years. I'm sure that you all have seen the news recently that the prosecution knowingly hid the existence of two other suspects who were never investigated. Loss of 23 youthful years of this Muslim student, Adnan Sayed, is a clear evidence of institutionalized bias. We are thankful to the board that you finally agreed with our request. However, we were alarmed recently that the board was considering to put one of the Muslim holidays on the chopping block to fix the calendar. COVID has taught us all that educating the children can be done virtually. Annandale County is seriously considering switching to virtual teaching on snow days. DCPS should follow the suit. It'll make the exercise to establish the calendar easier without having to take away any of the agreed upon closings of school on holidays of both minorities and not make it appear to be a discriminatory practice against Muslims. The country is divided and polarized because of misinformation, disinformation, or believing in alternative facts. In my humble opinion, is the duty and responsibility of the educators and the leaders to educate and unite the masses by their actions and non-discriminatory policies. I hope the, the board will make a decision based upon equality and justice as it did a few years ago. And congratulations to the teachers for getting Thank you. Our next speaker is Lloyd Allen. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. Thank you for your time. I am Lloyd Allen, he, him, special educator in mathematics speaking as an individual. Today is September 27, 2022, and this message expires in 34 days. Teacher loan forgiveness became a thing in 1998. This helped me choose to become a teacher. When I started teaching in 99, I had fresh brand new federal education loans that I took out to help take care of my master's ed at the Ohio State University, go Bucks, so that I would have some idea of what I was doing when I came into the classroom. I was stoked until I found out that I didn't qualify for, for forgiveness because of the school where I taught. I continued to plug away, making a payment each month and checking the list of eligible schools each summer. Then one day, my school magically appeared on the list. My principal certified that I had taught at that school for the requisite number of years and eventually the paperwork milled through the Department of Education. I received a letter that my payments were done, the loan was zeroed. To call that liberating would be an understatement. Like a toothache, I didn't realize how much the loan payment had been bothering me until it was gone. These programs exist to shape behavior in society. These little perks are super important. How do we get more educators? We make programs that let them know that they matter. We fund the programs so that they are still in place after folks have met all of their requirements. When there is uncertainty about these programs, they no longer shape behavior. Hey, educators and everyone else who has worked for government and or nonprofit for the last 10 years and who has any sort of federal education loan, you need to know that the public service loan forgiveness program is currently in waiver status and that it will be much easier to meet its requirements if you apply right now, assuming that you have 10 years in than if you wait. These waivers are based on the COVID state of emergency and they are expected to expire on Halloween at midnight. Please don't trust me. Search for PSLF yourself and check pages that have a .gov extension. Follow the directions and do it now. If you are an NEA member, for instance, a TABCO member or an ESPBC member, then consider searching for NEA PSLF. And the NEA has some tools to help you navigate the process. Please also note that PSLF is distinct from teacher loan forgiveness and is distinct from the loan forgiveness that is in the news right now. Do research quickly before the, uh, and I lost my place, uh, to figure out which one is best for you. BCPS, please expect an influx of applications. Please make it clear to your personnel who they should be asking to certify their service. 
and ensure that those staff have the support they need to process the incoming paperwork. Eliminating that one more payment may allow some of our educators and support staff to sleep ever so slightly more easily, which will allow us to give more focus and attention to our students. Folks, do it now. If you have federal loans and 10 years of service, apply now. Don't wait for the deadline to make the sad whooshing sound as it goes by. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Janelle Alston. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Janelle Alston, and I am the parent of three BCPS students and one BCPS graduate. I am also a former BCPS teacher. I resigned June 2020, sorry, June 2022, with approximately 999 other teachers. Now, I want to address the misconception that there is a teacher shortage. There is not a teacher shortage. There is a shortage of teachers who are willing to work in unsafe, disruptive environments where student behaviors negatively impact learning and teaching. In order to attract and retain highly qualified teachers, all schools must be safe and orderly, and that means developing and implementing behavior policies and then enforcing them with fidelity. There is not a teacher shortage. There is a shortage of teachers willing to work under the currently unsustainable, unrealistic workloads. In order to attract and retain teachers, the workloads and expectations must be reasonable and manageable. I'm going to say it again. There is not a teacher shortage. There is a shortage of teachers who are willing to sacrifice themselves financially, socially, emotionally, and or physically for the benefit of others. There are teachers available to work in school systems where the schools are safe and orderly. Teachers are available to school systems where the workload is reasonable and manageable. Teachers are available to school systems where they are able to maintain their financial, social, emotional, and physical well-being. Teachers are willing to work where the school systems enforce the behavior policies. There is not a teacher shortage. There is simply a shortage of teachers willing to wake, work in a place where they are not honored, valued, and respected as degreed, certified, licensed professionals. Our next speaker is Janet Blount. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Hen, Vice Chairman McMillian, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to share my experiences as a community partner at Woodmore Elementary School, where Mrs. Francesca Brown is the principal. I'm a member of Rising Sun First Baptist Church, and our pastor, Reverend Ingle Dawson Burns, emphasizes the need for church members to share our gifts and talents with our neighbors. My gifts and talents include being a career coach who provides career awareness experiences for elementary school students. Elementary school is not too early for students to be exposed to career possibilities. The following are, are examples of how we supported the Woodmore Elementary School staff's efforts to provide enriching experiences for grade three through five students. In 2021, when students were having a mixture of virtual and in-person instruction, I collaborated with Mrs. Asia Martin, the school counselor, and provided 16 virtual Career Month speakers. 
Mrs. Martin provided to me a list of six questions the speakers should answer. The speakers recorded their responses on their cell phones, forwarded the recording to me, and I converted the recordings to YouTube videos. Students had an opportunity to hear speakers from organizations such as LabCorp, Deloitte Touche, T. Rowe Price. In February 2022, Whitmore Elementary and International Baccalaureate School hosted a World Cultures event. I collaborated with Mr. Brendan Penn, who was the Community Partners Coordinator last year. I sent out over 100 emails, and 11 people agreed to participate in this event. The 11 included professors and staff from Morgan State University who were born in Cairo, Spain, Tehran. Rising Sun First Baptist Church members contributed school uniforms such as polo shirts, pants, and skirts to the Whitmore Elementary School uniform drive. This year, I'm collaborating with Mrs. Falber, the reading specialist, to develop an outreach effort to locate volunteers who are passionate about helping kindergarten students enhance their reading skills. I'm also working with Mrs. Brown, the school principal, and her staff to develop ways to incorporate career awareness experiences into the curriculum. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bosch Farron. Good evening to all. Good evening. Communication. Special thanks for Vice Chair McMillian for his communication on Facebook, listening, listening, and trying to help teachers worry about their retirement. Special thanks also for Ms. Joes for her communication to the public. So in 1956, the U.S. established transatlantic cable line with Europe. Communication was very important then. It's extremely important today. In that venue, the central area had a reasonable presentation on 21st. About 17, maybe 18 people attended. Five of them only were Baltimore County residents. The rest are the members and the speakers. That is not cost-effective communication occupying two employees' times to talk to only five residents of the county. There are more than 30 schools in the central area. Equity. A Bill of Rights has been established in 1789, but we still have issues with equity till today. Of course, the example of that is that this school system gave the Jewish holidays as off days for 25 years. And Adnan Sayed, you already heard about him. He was an ex-student in Baltimore County Public Schools. You wonder how many Adnan Sayeds there are out there. So the disparities affecting blacks, Latinos, Muslims, and more are there in the school, in healthcare, etc. And I think it's important for you to consider that it is not just a black and white issue. It is an issue for many of us. Last, I respectfully request that the system would be transparent and would answer my emails since December 15, 2021, until yesterday. 
Motel 6 treated me well. Hampton Inn treated me well. Hyatt treated me well. Thank you. Our next speaker is Erica Ma. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, members of the BOE and BCPS. My name is Erica Ma, and I'm here as a teacher and a parent. First of all, I'd like to say that I'm very sad not to be able to speak in front of my former BOE member, Lisa Mack. She always listened to parents and teachers, used data, and cared about the students first, foremost, and always. I wish her the very best as she takes care of her health and heads into surgery this week. Lisa is taking her health as a priority as well she should, and we in BCPS need to focus on our priorities. Our priorities should be our students and the teachers who teach them, but I have not been convinced that this is truly so. It seems like we have prioritized telling everyone how well-staffed our county is. But as a parent, I can tell you that we are not fully staffed. When classes are canceled, teachers have higher class sizes than ever, and classes are staffed with interns, long-term subs, or conditional teachers. That is not fully staffed. Those are band-aided staffs. And what are we doing to prioritize those long-term subs and conditional teachers, some of whom are excellent and have the potential to become great teachers? We should probably start by paying them in a timely manner. It has been over a month, and there are still subs and conditional teachers all over the county who have not yet been paid, or have only been paid a fraction of what is owed to them. You, cannot, you can have all the job fairs you want in the world and tell everyone we are well-staffed, but if you do not, do not prioritize paying them, they will quit, and no one will blame them. We should also prioritize the retention of high-quality, experienced teachers. And while I welcome and thank you for the raises and bonuses announced today, you continue to tell us that you cannot find the money to pay for the negotiated salary scale. Yet we have prioritized administrative staff for years, 100 more than either Prince George's and in Montgomery, both counties that are larger than us. They have only 121 and 135 respectively. We have 282. Yes, these numbers are from 2019, but it was a year after that we were not given our steps. So what are our priorities? Teachers with extensive knowledges of student history are leaving and taking the knowledge with them. This affects seniors and special educators and elementary school kids who ask where their last year's teachers have gone because they miss them. The new teachers are caring, wonderful people, but need mentors to be successful. And some schools have as many as 20 new staff, and there aren't experienced teachers to help them. To help them. And a priority or lack thereof that drives parents crazy on a daily basis are buses. A number of times a week since the beginning of school, school buses are still late. In our southwest area, we had a day where four elementary schools with that had at least one or two buses late an hour or more. Staffing shortage, right? So why is it that the local high school was able to get their athletic team around the Beltway to a game on time at 4 p.m.? Why was another team able to come to our area for a game? And why was there a bus sitting empty of students waiting for over an hour on the high school for the game to end? Meanwhile, nearly 100 elementary school students were left stranded. We are a public school system. That means our priorities should be taking care of our youngest and most vulnerable children. Please help us teachers truly keep our children as a priority. Thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker is Quinn Sunderman Zinger. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Quinn Sunderman Zinger. I'm a seventh grader at Ridgely Middle School, and my goal today is to encourage you to add gender neutral bathrooms and locker rooms to our, to throughout Baltimore County schools, and a gender neutral change. At my school, we only have one um, bathroom that is not limited to a single gender, such as male or female. Not many people in my school know about this bathroom, not even people who need it to feel safe or comfortable. It is located inside of our nurse's office and can take valuable learning time away from class to walk to, especially when I'm on the other side of the school, whereas people who use the male or female bathrooms can simply just walk out of the classroom, and there is a bathroom that they use nearby in almost every single classroom in my school. However, I have friends that come up to me and tell me how they have to hold their pee all day because they are scared to use the bathroom because they are transgender or don't identify as male or female. I personally identify as non-binary and use both bathrooms. I would definitely feel more comfortable in a gender-neutral bathroom. I also have a problem with locker rooms. 
because I personally feel extremely uncomfortable changing in the boys' locker room, which I was assigned to because I am biologically male. I notice others staring at me in the locker room, and people ask me, shouldn't you be in the girls' locker room? And I feel like it is most likely the same situation would happen if I were in a female locker room. This makes me feel extremely uncomfortable in my body and gives me gender dysphoria. I would also like to point out that I understand some people would not feel safe in a gender-neutral bathroom or locker room, so I still believe we should keep the male and female bathrooms. Thank you for your time, and please consider adding gender-neutral bathrooms throughout the school and a gender-neutral locker room. Thank you, Quinn. Next is public comment on board policy 8500, board self-evaluation, and for that I call on Bosch Farone. Madam Chair, you already voted on it, right? I'm sorry, Dr. Farone? You already voted on the policies, correct? on this as well as the superintendent evaluation on first reader, yes, to accept the recommendation. Why do I need to? <laughs> Good evening. Policy 8500, correct, ma'am? Correct. Okay. Um, Line 24 to 26, annually in May, the board will conduct a self-assessment. My concern is that you probably will be doing self-assessment in closed session. I don't know if that's true, but that's my sense. And I think it should be in public. And I recommend that in the same section that at least you mention what the metrics of it. I always ask you for a footnote because when I read the policy and I see words and I wonder what do they mean, you know. And I attend the board for a long, long time and if it's not clear to me, you can imagine it would be not really clear to many of the parents out there. Uh, in that same venue about self-assessment, I request that you consider an input from the public. So if the board, the 13 of you, assess yourself without public input, I think it would be weaker. Item 10C, the board will review its progress on a quarterly basis in that the policy doesn't mention anything about public participation, doesn't mention anything about oversight. So what I am saying that there needs to be checks and balances and this policy does not really have the public in it. I don't see it. Um, and I request that you would assess it as such. Since I have 40 seconds, there is a bracket in the beginning of it and the bracket opens to the left side. There is no bracket to the right side. I don't know if that's really important or not, but anyhow, that's what it is. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like me to speak and to the next one? Yes, please. Um, next is public comment on board policy 8501, the superintendent evaluation. And All right. you are so, our only speaker on that policy. So Dr. Williams, this has nothing to do with you. All right, I just want to make sure. It's a general comment. Item 16 is about annual assessment of the superintendent where the chair and the superintendent will meet to agree about format evaluation. Again, this is a private meeting. There is no input of the public in that. And Baltimore County Public School has the word public 
I don't see really the public in it. I personally believe it should be an open process. Then in another one, uh, the board will, item number 24, will provide the superintendent with an informal review about goals and objectives. I like to see a footnote, what are the goals and the objectives? Again, for me, as a person who attend this board and read the website, etc., I feel it's important for the public to know. And you can imagine about parents who are not as involved, who really don't know what the goals and the objectives. Line number 31, performance of the superintendent and evaluation shall be performed and about expectations. Again, I'd like to see a footnote about what are the expectations. Item number 41, evaluation either orally, etc. I don't see the public involved in that. So, we pay lots of taxes, everyone, including me, including the salary of the superintendent. We, as the public, have the right to know about the performance of the superintendent. I ask you to make this process as public as you can, because it is public school. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that I call on Mr. Brusades. Good evening. Good evening. Earlier tonight, the board met in closed session in its quasi-judicial capacity to render decisions in the following cases, HE 22-40, HE 22-41, HE 23-08 and SD 2021-22-05. Now would be an appropriate time to confirm the vote taken in closed session. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on hearing examiner's cases HE 22-40, 22-41, 23-08, and SD 2021-22-05, and authorize Ms. Gover to sign for those board members not physically present. So moved, Hassan. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Hager. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Proceedings. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the consideration of the updated Office of Internal Audit Work Plan, and for that I call on Mr. McMillian, Chair of the Audit Committee. Good evening. Members of the Board, the Board's Audit Committee met on Tuesday, September 20th, 2022, and unanimously approved the Office of Internal Audit's Work Plan as presented in Exhibit I. It is being forwarded to the full Board for approval. May I have a motion to approve the recommendation of the Audit Committee to approve the Office of Internal Audit Work Plan? So move, Stileski. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Mr. Kuhn? Ms. Hen? Abstain. <clears throat> Favor is eight. Thank you. The motion passes.
The next item on the agenda is the report on the proposed 2023-2024 school calendar. And for that, I call on Ms. Charlie Green. Hello. Welcome back. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Board Chair Hinn, Vice Chair McMillian, Dr. Williams, and members of the Board of Education. In accordance with board policy and superintendent's rule 6301, the superintendent is charged with convening a committee to assist in the development of a school calendar. The committee meets 16 months prior to the school year for which the calendar, for which the calen uh, the calendar committee is making the recommendation. One or more calendar options are to be presented to the board no later than the first regular meeting in October. The committee met on May 16, 2022 and May 23, 2022 to develop a calendar for the 23-24 school year. Tonight, I present the committee's recommendation. As you are aware, the board has not yet indicated a preference for a calendar with either a pre or post Labor Day start to the school year. Therefore, by a majority vote, the committee recommended a pre Labor Day start, uh, start calendar for the 22-23 school year. Next slide, please. Maryland state law dicta dictates the minimum number of school days and the minimum number of student contact hours that must be met annually by all Maryland school systems. School calendars must be comprised of a minimum of 180 student days offering elementary and middle school students 1,080 contact hours and high school students 1,170 contact hours. Next slide, please. State law also spells out holidays to be observed in Maryland's public schools and minimally included in all school calendars. Those 14 days are depicted on this slide. This slide does not include BCPS days off, such as spring break closures beyond the Friday before and after Easter. Next slide, please. This slide indicates the number of board approved professional development days to be included in the school calendar. Per the board's direction, for those holidays falling on a weekend, the professional development day was scheduled for either the preceding Friday or following Monday. Diwali, Lunar New Year, and Eid al Fitr were approved by the board to be recognized as a professional development day for teachers and school closure for students at its meeting on November 23, 2021. Eid al Hadha and Juneteenth fall outside of the school year and therefore does not impact professional development days, nor will students be present in school. Next slide, please. In addition to the requested professional development days, the proposed calendar includes a closure day for elementary school conferences, as well as five scheduled early releases for all students in all schools. All closures and all hours in which students are not in school must be taken into consideration in computing, in computing student days and student contact hours. Next slide, please. As stated earlier, the committee's pre-Labor Day recommendation is based on the perceived infeasibility of a post-Labor Day calendar option. And this slide shows, uh, depicts some of that, but I will go through uh, what the reasoning and rationale was. A post-Labor Day start would cause the calendar to run over by one teacher day, and there is no way in the committee's estimation to adjust the calendar to meet both the student and teacher days requirement that is at least within the current framework. The only way to modify the post-Labor Day calendar would be to choose one of the following options. One is to either pay teachers and support staff to work an additional day. Two would be to cut a pre-service teacher day from the week teachers report back to school. Or three, make a PD day a non-school day for students and teachers, which some might see as inequitable. As stated earlier, the calendar will come before the board next month for public comment and again in November for board action. Board policy and superintendent's rule dictates or states rather that final approval of the calendar with any proposed amendments must be made by the board no later than its first public meeting in November. So this concludes the recommendation that was made by the calendar committee. At this time, I'm happy to respond to any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Charlie Green. Mm -hmm. um, board members, are there any questions? Okay, Dr. Hager. Um, 
Thank you. Uh, I have um, three questions. Sure. So there are, the state is now mandating two days after Easter as, so, so it looks like the two days after Easter are now um, days off of school and the PowerPoint said. Um, so my, let me go back to, which slide are you speaking to? Um, um, slide three and then on the calendar, it also shows, uh, my, my question was going to be what's up with April 2nd, but then I saw that it said two days after. It is, so it's the Friday before and the Monday after, so it is two days, that's correct. Monday after, sorry, too many things open on my calendar. Mm -hmm. But the first and second are days off of school, Monday and Tuesday. Uh, I have to look at an actual calendar. And schools are reopening on Wednesday after spring break for the, I think, the first time. So the state mandated days are those two days that are there, and you're saying there's an additional day and why is yeah. the question? I would actually have to go back to the calendar committee okay, and get, I was just curious no, I, I'm happy to bring that, uh, bring that forward and, and provide an answer for you. Okay, yeah, it just struck me as, as a extended spring break that I hadn't seen before. Mm -hmm. um, and with the pre-Labor Day calendar, um, the Muslim holiday of Eid al-Adha is not in danger of being taken away not. for that is, um, a snow day. That is correct. And is it correct that the I saw in the memo that the committee recommends that the board provide definitive guidance on the start of the school year for future calendars regarding pre or post, cal post Labor Day? That is correct. Uh, the calendar committee actually spoke extensively about uh, families' desire to know uh, that school starts either pre or post Labor Day and whatever decision was made that if at all possible, uh, we can make that decision moving forward. Okay, would that be a motion that the board would entertain, is that? I would entertain a motion. Okay. Yes. Um, you can move on to others. I'll okay. Mrs. Causey. Good evening. Uh, thank you for that presentation. Um, in a conversation uh, that the board had around calendars several months ago, uh, I believe there was a motion made and passed to uh, do a survey of um, parents and I believe staff around these calendar issues. Um, so I'm wondering if any survey has been done in advance of developing this calendar. So thank you for that question. Yes, uh, there was a motion that was made in November of last year to survey staff specifically. Um, and we did conduct a survey of staff. As you can imagine, uh, that survey was split. Uh, there was, you know, a slight preference for a post Labor Day calendar. I'm happy to share the responses from that calendar with uh, the board in a future board update. Prior to that, that request came forward from the board because prior to that there had been surveys of the community. Um, I will tell you that based on my research, that was a couple years ago. That's not as recent as the employee survey, but the motion that was made and the request was that we do an employee survey. And so we have those results. So those uh, results had not yet been um, shown to the board or the public? I believe they have, but I cannot confirm that, Ms. Causey. That would have been November of last year, and so I'm happy to confirm that, and if not, happy to share uh, that information directly with the board. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And also around the issue of uh, early release days, um, because that's something that's uh, new, um, so it would be good to get feedback um, from staff and also um, parents, because we have received some emails over time about um, difficulties for uh, parents at work and um, also <clears throat> having early release removes hours that are available to um, use to fulfill the educational requirement in case there's uh, late starts uh, because of weather um, where a whole day's not missed, but the time, but the time is missed. Um, so that, that would be helpful. And then um, I'll hold my other questions. I need to look, look back at the presentation. So if someone else has any questions, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the presentation, for sharing updates on the calendar, things that we're gonna be seeing in the coming few months. Um, my question is is based on PD days. I just wanted to clarify, is there any 
I guess, penalty um, that educators, teachers face who are Muslim or Jewish celebrating those holidays? Um, are they free to celebrate? How does that look in, you know, in the schoolhouse? And how can we ensure that that continues to happen, you know, as it is and, and we improve upon that so they have access to those days off as well? Absolutely. So thank you for the question. Uh, we certainly do uh, encourage and support that staff members, employees, everyone uh, should enjoy uh, the ability to observe religious holidays. Professional development that is offered on those days is offered at another time in another way for uh, people who are observant on that day. Dr. Hager? Sure, and I also I, I forgot to mention that I'm, I'm very proud of the calendar that we've developed with the holidays that are very inclusive, and I think that that's a very good thing for our school system. Um, so I would like to make a motion, and the motion is I move that the calendar committee develop calendar options presented to the Board of Education with a pre-Labor Day start for future calendars. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Hassan. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Sorry, Madam Chair, I can't type that fast. I've, Go ahead, Mrs. Causey. Thank you. Um, I think the board should uh, see the um, survey of the staff and also understand what was the latest survey of um, the parents uh, before we uh, conclude um, on on a, a stance of pre or post Labor Day. Um, so I, I won't be supporting this. There's already a pre, a, excuse me, a post, a, a pre Labor Day option um, that's in the presentation. So I don't feel that this motion is necessary at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Hager, I see that you have a comment on the comment and I have a question on your motion. So if you'd like to go ahead with your comment first and then I have a question. I thought that we saw those survey results, and for, and this is just based on my memory, but I thought that the response rate was fairly small at the time, and I know that TABCO has done prior surveys that have shown a preference for a pre-Labor Day start. So I would just um, potentially interpret, you know, either survey with caution if, if we have two differing results from different methodology, just mentioning that. No, I, I appreciate that, and as I said earlier, I cannot confirm that I apologize. I just don't. I uh, know uh, if that was shared or not, so I do want to share that just in the interest of transparency to make sure that you have that. It is my recollection, having seen it myself, that it was a, rare, a fairly small sample size and it was evenly split, um, you know, with a slight preference for one or the other, but happy to share with the board. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, my question slash comment on this motion, I, I support it I, in that we have a pre-Labor Day start option for the current item of business. Um, it seems to be policy making in, in my sense in that there's no um, end date in terms of for, for future calendars. And if this is um, the will of the board to put it in policy, I believe that's um, that we have a different venue where we could put it in policy. I'm not sure that this is a directive that we could lock the board into for all future calendars without putting it in policy. So that would be my only reservation about the non-specificity of the motion. So if, if you would like to make it specific, it, I don't know if that was your intent on, on doing so, that would be my only concern about. Yeah, my intent was just to support the calendar committee's request <laughs> to have some more definitive guidance moving forward. Sure. So this is the um, first reader that of the correct. proposed 23-24 school calendar. I may have meant to read this or was supposed to read this earlier. Um, the public hearing on the calendar will be held during the next board meeting on Tuesday, October 11th, with the second reader in consideration of the calendar on Wednesday, November 8th, 2022. So if um, the board has any desired actions, we have the opportunity following the public hearing um, and consideration, final consideration on Wednesday, November 8th. So as Ms. Charlie Green stated, we are um, required um, per policy to adopt a calendar at that meeting. So there is a motion and a second on the floor. Um, Dr. Hager, would you like to continue with the roll call vote or 
would you like to withdraw <laughs> your? It doesn't matter to me. I, I, again, I, I would, if we want to postpone it to the next meeting, that's fine. I just wanted to, again. Or amend your I was just reading the, the memo and trying to be helpful. Specific. Um, we, can, we can withdraw it and, and talk, discuss it at the next calendar conversation if that's preferred. Whatever. Sure. It's fine. And it was seconded by? I can withdraw my second. Mrs. Hassan? Yep. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Hassan. Any further discussion, board members? Madam Chair, this is Ms. Causey. Ms. Causey. Um, given that the sample size was small and um, the prior parent survey was some time ago and many things have changed um, in the in the last three years, um, what I'm I'm asking staff or Dr. Williams, what is the uh, possibility of doing a survey um, in addition to the public comment? around the issues of pre or post Labor Day and also the early release days. Is your question to Dr. Williams, Mrs. Causey? Yes. So thank you, Ms. Causey. Um, I believe this time a year ago, we did the exact same thing. Um, we requested a survey, we got a small sampling and it was almost 50-50. And so it is a lot of work um, and the research folks are not present. And I remember the work they had to do to one, to develop it. One might think it's simple to develop, but then they also have to analyze it and report back. Um, I think at the same time, TAPCO through the leadership of Ms. Sexton did something as well. And um, it was also kind of split as what, if I recall, but there is a possibility of doing that. Um, it just seems like it comes up around this year every time about doing the survey. And, and I think the team, the committee works real hard to try to make some agreements and reach agreements. And I think even last year they came forward and asked for a multi-year Dr. Hager calendar. So we're not doing this every year. Um, so it's just the, 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 the desire of the board, but that's one more thing we have to do. And I don't know what kind of information that we will, we will receive to help persuade you one way or the other. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And the virtual learning um, during inclement weather days, that survey was um, concluded. And so will that information be provided to the board uh, in time for consideration? Because that can also Cosey, impact the calendar, time. is that correct? Oh, and that's okay. time. So if Ms. Charlie Green would like to respond to that. The data will be provided yes. to the board about the virtual learning options. Okay. Did you did you hear that answer, Mrs. Causey? Yes, thank you very much. That'll sure. be helpful. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Um, Ms. Joes? Thank you. Dr. Williams, there's been many surveys done in the past few years in the calendar. Uh, so instead of trying to reinvent the wheel, if the board could get a compilation of all of those surveys so we could make a more informed decision, uh, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Yes, we can go back to our archives and pull yes. the results of those surveys. Thank you, Ms. Joes. I would add to that if there are any stakeholder groups that have independently surveyed their members, if they would be willing to share their survey data with the board, we are, it sounds like there's significant interest in that data. We would love to receive it. Sounds good. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Charlie Green. All right. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on the FY 2023 opening of schools. For that, I call on Dr. Zarchin. Good evening. Good evening. Hey, good evening, Board Chair Hen. Vice Chair McMillian, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. We are pleased to present the opening of schools report to the board and Team BCPS. 
This report includes changes, updates, and evidence of our strategic plan, the COMPASS, our pathway to excellence in action. The COMPASS, our pathway to excellence, identifies five focus areas from our work. Our priorities are learning, accountability, and results. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Safe and supportive environment, high-performing workforce and alignment of human capital, community engagement and partnerships, and operational excellence. This is the work of Team BCPS to ensure that every student graduates college and career ready. Next slide, please. We had an exciting opening of school, a truly exciting opening of school. On August 29th, we happily welcomed back approximately 110,000 students. Smiles, laughter, high fives were abundant. It was a positive start, a long awaited and very positive start. Team BCPS was definitely ready for the school year to begin. Through our, throughout our school visits, there was strong evidence of preparation, hard work, and teamwork. Let's take a moment to hear from three of our principals about their priorities and what they're looking forward to this year with a video from BCPS TV. As a second year principal here at Wellwood International, I was most excited, honestly, about just seeing the faces of my staff and students, seeing their faces, seeing them collaborate with each other, really getting an opportunity to get to know my staff and know my students and continue to build on the wonderful, wonderful work that's taking place here at Wellwood each and every day. We prepared for students and staff returning to the school building this year. As a leadership team, we met over the summer. We really looked at our data and we determined what are our goals for this coming school year. And then once we determined our goals, well, where are we as a school? And then what are our action steps that we can take to make progress towards meeting our goals? We prepared professional development for our teachers. That's, that's really important, making sure that our teachers and all of our staff members have the professional development opportunities that they need in order to grow as professionals as well. My top priority for this school year is simple, really just making sure that my staff and students have their social, emotional, and academic needs met. And this is going to be done through really making sure that my teachers feel supported, and then in turn, being able to provide that differentiated instruction to my students, really meeting our students where they are in order to make sure their needs are being met as well. Being the first year as a principal here at Lansdowne Middle School, the thing I was most excited for was to meet our students and our families. This summer I had a couple community events with our local Lansdowne Elementary School, then also had a town hall meeting here at our school. And during that time I was able to connect with our families and our students, try to get to know them. But then also as the school year started, it's been really exciting for me being in classrooms and hallways, being you know, able to connect with our students, work with them in small groups, because that's the most favorite part of my job. This summer I was able to meet our families and our students, but then also our staff members. I had one-to-one -one meetings with them, and I also had whole group meetings and town hall sessions. Through that time, I was able to talk to our community about what the needs are for our school. And one of the things that came out that was most preparing for us that we want to make sure we're taking pride in our school. So this year we created a school beautification team. We worked on the exterior of our school, creating our gardens outside, and also the interior by painting murals, by painting lion paws throughout our school, having lion faces throughout our building, and also creating these living spaces where students can really feel like this is like home to them or a place that they can take pride in and are proud of. In addition to that, we also work with our instructional leadership team to set high expectations for our students and our staff members. For this upcoming school year, we're really focused on building a positive school climate and culture in our building where teaching and learning can occur. We are committed to making sure that we build positive relationships with our students, making them feel like they're valued as people, making sure they feel comfortable taking risks in our classrooms, while also building trusting relationships with the adults in our building. In addition to our students, we are committed to connecting with our families as well, to make sure that they feel like they have the resources and the tools necessary to help their child be successful this school year. The start of the school year for me, it's like 
when all the magic happens. It is the um, absolute start of all the possibilities that are going to unfold throughout the school year. It's all of the areas in which students are gonna grow academically and, and even exceed their own expectations. It's where students are going to thrive in finding new interests or even in growing in their abilities and skills in their current interests. And it's where teachers are going to refine their gift and their craft in the classrooms, providing excellent educational opportunities for our students. Planning is so complex and it involves so many different layers. So we have to think about our facilities, our safety, our educational aspects, every area within the school. And then we work to refine and improve on what we did the previous year. So reflecting back on how we did the previous year allows us to set achievable and attainable goals and push ourselves to excel just a little bit more the next year. Our number one priority is always student safety. And with that, it's developing a space where students feel completely comfortable to learn and excel. So we take a look at the student and staff holistically and try to ensure that we put supports in place that meet their needs. Our motto this year is we can, we will, no excuses. And that no excuses part is really for us, the admin team and the leaders of the building trying to remove any obstacle that is in the way of success and build in supports that allow everyone to feel like they're going to be successful at the end of the school year. All right, so I wanna thank Team BCPS for the great videos. Acknowledge the three principles highlighted and recognize each of our principals who really made this a great opening. Uh, if we could move to the next slide, please. As evidenced by the three principals in the video across levels and zones, school teams worked extremely hard this summer to prepare for a smooth and safe opening and set a tone for the year marked by positive engagement and academic excellence. Every year, instructional leadership teams come together to review practices and procedures that create the climate and the conditions for success. In July, principals participated in a two-day annual conference to level set expectations and review processes focused on teaching and learning, wellness, and safe and supportive environments. In July and August, school teams took a deeper dive into student academic and climate data to set goals for the school year. School leaders analyzed student progress and areas of opportunity to create tailor-made plans with specific outcomes and professional learning. School progress plans at a glance are available for all members of Team BCPS to see on school websites. Next slide, please. There we go, thank you. Communication and collaboration was addressed throughout the summer. Team BCPS worked with stakeholders, school leaders, and union partners to update guidance and review expectations for students and their families. The Office of Communications created the Back to BCPS campaign to keep Team BCPS informed about our progress and expectations. We will continue to share information as we update our resources and website to ensure that our families can stay connected. Preparing for the opening of schools is a complex process requiring careful coordination across all divisions and departments to ensure that all buildings are ready, staff are equipped, and students are warmly welcomed into the new school year. The willingness of members of Team BCPS to come together early and often to problem solve truly made a difference. We move forward with innovative and creative solutions to meet the needs of school communities. During the August administrative and supervisory meeting, Dr. Williams reminded us to continue engaging in essential leadership practices. School leaders responded and continue to do a masterful job 
of prioritizing communication and outreach to school communities, translating information effectively to clearly communicate school stories, celebrations, and needs, and providing steadfast support for one another while being firm around accountability. We all have a role to play in student success, and we want to provide the information needed so each member of our team, students, parents, and staff, can be actively involved in our work. The Department of Schools executive directors worked with individual school leadership teams to prepare for the start of the school year. They have and continue to serve as leaders of leaders. They positively impact schools each and every day. Each of our 10 executive directors have served as highly effective principals, and they share their experience and expertise with schools through coaching, supervision, and supporting all aspects of school leadership and learning. At this time, I would like to recognize each of the executive directors, uh, ask them to stand so we can recognize their hard work and commitment to Team BCPS. I don't know that we could have a finer group of people and educators supporting our schools. Our team has created a data monitoring calendar for principals to assist with utilizing data to diagnose gaps and assess student performance as they work through the curriculum. Using this tool, instructional leaders are able to plan for quality teaching and learning. Our executive directors can more strategically coach school leaders and staff to ensure that high levels of teaching and learning occur at scale. This year, we remain focused on four key goals, accelerating learning, promoting social emotional wellness, setting and upholding standards of excellence, and increasing data literacy. Our goal is to ensure coordinated supports to teachers and principals. Several offices, including teacher leadership, organizational development, peer assistance and review, and academics have come together to develop a robust plan that prioritizes system learning and individualized support to meet the needs of staff. This slide depicts our efforts to support our staff and invest in their success. We exist for students to learn. Our teaching and learning framework clearly outlines five core beliefs, equitable access, high expectations, culturally relevant pedagogy, responsive instruction, and professional learning communities to meet student needs. With the exciting return to this school year is the acknowledgement that we have academic work to do. We must have a laser-like focus on fidelity of curricular implementation and examination of formative assessments in order to improve outcomes. Schools have been trained on how to use data tools, curriculum, and assessments. This is the year to put this learning into practice with rigorous structures to monitor, evaluate, and course correct as needed. That means balancing opportunities for enrichment and support to meet the unique needs of all students. When student needs are unmet, we will use the data to find out why and decide what we need to do differently to meet their needs. This slide details specifics regarding the BCPS plan to enhance safety in our schools based on student needs, staff input, and stakeholder feedback. Implementation is well underway, and we will continue sharing ongoing, community with, ongoing communication with the BCPS community regarding expectations and mutual support of our schools. Our upgrades have been focused on increased human resources, implementation, communication, and consistency of application of existing policies, additional opportunities to provide direct student support, 
and proactive training and skill building for staff and students. We are pleased to host our first virtual town hall on October 13th, focused on our efforts to ensure student safety, available community resources, and opportunities to build positive partnerships for student support. The FY23 budget priorities principal survey identified safety assistance as the third most frequently requested support for the year. We're pleased to report that through the use of grant funds, we were able to hire more than 140 safety assistants and move to full implementation in all secondary schools this fall. Our safety assistants were equitably allocated based on enrollment. They received summer and fall professional development that's still ongoing, including team BCPS expectations, school specific expectations, and participation in 70 hours of training provided by the Maryland Center for School Safety. And they focus on maintaining a safe and supportive environment through a proactive presence while responding to emergent needs. These positions support school teams and SROs in partnership with the Office of School Safety and School Administration. In addition to school coverage, student safety assistants are providing support at athletic events and other large gatherings. Our next steps include creating an elementary cluster model of support. We know that students are more likely to succeed when schools, families, and communities work together in partnership to maximize and support student learning. This summer, we had our inaugural partnership fair where stakeholders came together to discuss how they could support students and families. Today, the first partnership newsletter was shared. We will continue regular and deliberate outreach to bring our community leaders volunteers, and mentors into school buildings to support our students. We value our families and look forward to strong partnerships. We'll continue to update the board, our community, and Team BCPS during these exciting times. We're grateful for a positive school opening and are looking forward to an even greater year. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arbor, Dr. Sarchin. Thank you for that presentation. Do we have other questions? Okay. Board members, any questions for Dr. Zarch and Dr. Yarber? Or comments? No? Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on the community eligibility provision and food and nutrition. For that, I call on Dr. Yarborough and Ms. Hetzler. Good evening. Good evening again. Board Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, and Dr. Williams and members of the board, we're pleased to present the Food and Nutrition Services update to Team BCPS this evening. I'm joined by Jamie Hetzler, Director, Terry Smith, Manager, Food and Nutrition Services Operations, and Joanne English Calvert, Senior Operations Supervisor, Food and Nutrition Services. This evening, we will share information about programs, menu guidelines, quality controls, and initiatives. Next slide, please. The mission of the Office of Food and Nutrition Services is to provide fresh and healthy meals so that students can focus on learning. We work within state and federal guidelines to meet the needs of our students on a daily basis. At this time, the team will provide further details about our available programs, processes, and initiatives. Jamie. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you for having us here today to present an update for the Food Nutrition Program. From March of 2020 through the end of last school year, all meals were provided free of charge to all students nationwide. 
As you all know, Congress did not extend that program into this school year. However, we have been able to expand the, many of the programs that we provide to the students. First, we now have 87 schools that participate in the CEP program. This is a provision of the Healthy Hunger-Free Kids Act and allows us to serve breakfast and lunch at no cost to all enrolled students and eliminates the requirement for the free and reduced meal application in CEP schools. The next, which is my absolute favorite, uh, is the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program. We are excited that we received funding to expand to 27 elementary schools this year. The program promotes fresh fruit and vegetables in high need schools and allows students to sample a variety of items in the classroom that they otherwise might not have the opportunity to experience. The goal is to introduce a variety of fresh fruits and vegetables to young children with the outcome of increasing their consumption of fresh produce and therefore establishing better eating habits at a young age. <coughs> Excuse me. Typically, a unique fruit or vegetable is provided for each classroom, including colorful flyers about the item that teachers review with the class. They're able to see and touch the item in its whole uncut form and then taste the samples as well. It's really a great program that the students truly get excited to be a part of. Uh, next is the Maryland Meals for Achievement, which increased to 109 schools this year. It uses state funding to allow participating schools to serve free breakfast in the classroom. In elementary schools, breakfast is delivered to the individual classrooms, while in secondary schools, it's served in various locations throughout the school, typically near entrances to promote high participation. All enrolled students at a participating school are automatically eligible for breakfast at no cost. By increasing the access and participation in breakfast, students are better prepared for their academic day. Next slide, please. Uh, to review some of the menu guidelines, uh, the USDA requires all schools to meet strict regulations surrounding both the individual products and the mix of items served. Levels of saturated fat, sodium, and trans fat are evaluated by a registered dietitian before products are selected for menus. Then the products are formed into weekly menus that meet both daily and weekly requirements for protein, grains, fruits, and vegetables. For example, a middle school student's lunch would consist of three to five items from the list, and always includes at least one fruit or vegetable. <coughs> Excuse me. If they would like more, they can easily select up to two fruits and vegetables each day. Next slide, please. The quality of the food we serve is key to supporting a positive learning environment. First, the number of total meals we serve has increased 33% since 2012, and by 50% if we go all the way back to 2009. With the support of grants, we have been focusing on increasing the oven capacity in elementary schools. When they have the capacity to produce more food on site, their ability to control the quality of the food is greatly improved. We have removed items that could not consistently meet the quality standards, especially with those oven capacity constraints. Our internal quality control process begins with the product selection and then continues all the way through meal service. On occasion, as with any food service operation, there are unforeseen occasions where a product is found to be unacceptable. <clears throat> Excuse me. For example, we obviously recently had a problem with the quality of our chocolate milk, and we were luckily able to remove that item from service immediately. We encourage both families and students to be active participants in our quality control program. If a student is not happy with a meal, whether for preference or for quality reasons, we encourage them to share that with the cafeteria staff or a teacher as soon as possible. It is our goal to provide a positive experience in the cafeteria every day. Controlling the amount of food waste that we generate has monumental impacts to both the environment and our budget. According to the USDA, more than one third of all food goes uneaten through loss or waste. Last year, these four schools participated in a pilot food waste reduction program where we tested and developed the initial launch. Data was collected, goals were identified, and communication methods were tested. Then we were able to introduce the initiative in all schools at the start of this school year. We expect to save 25 tons of milk and 18 tons of fruit cups from the landfill in just the first year alone. Next slide, please. Updating our menus and fresh, with fresh, healthy options supports not only our primary mission, but our food waste reduction initiatives as well. First, we removed items that did, a not, that did not align with these goals, like donuts and chocolate muffins. We added fresh fruit and vegetable selections to increase the variety of fresh items available to students each day. There are now at least three fresh fruits and three fresh, fresh vegetables offered daily. There's also a rotating menu that includes new entree salads and sandwiches. 
One very exciting new item is bento boxes that we will begin in early October. To start, there's a few different varieties. One has a hard cooked egg, one pepperoni and cheese, and one hummus. Each one includes four different items and a variety of fresh fruits and vegetables. All of these new menu choices support our mission of providing fresh and nutritious meals to students while minimizing food waste. If a student is served a single vegetable, it might not be their preference. However, if we provide a variety of fresh options, it's much more likely that they will consume what they chose to take. Thank you for all of your support. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank our amazing team for all the hard work that they put in every day uh, to support our students. At this time, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Sure. Board members, questions? Mr. McMillian. Good evening. I'm curious about the food waste program. Mm -hmm. So how can you, can you elaborate just a little bit on that? Sure, we started a pilot program last year. Um, it started with four schools that were the, they actually were the initial four schools that started with composting. And then we you know, increased upon that with the food waste pilot. So what we did is we collect, collected all the data for food that was being taken out of the line, being served to the students and then not and then going into either into the trash can or what used to be the share tables before COVID. So we counted, collected all that data, um, ran that for a few months. Then we did some development, created communication, some signs, some training, pushed that out to just those four schools, tested it. Some things worked, some things didn't. We adjusted, changed those communication methods, changed the training, changed the signs that didn't work, um, tested it again. Hopefully, obviously, there was some pr improvement. Then we took all the things that did work and then launched it for the beginning of this school year. So things like, um, you know, my favorite example is that uh, milk that is a, a great part of, of lunch, um, a lot of students don't like milk. They just don't want it at all. However, it's been a longstanding tradition in schools that every child takes the milk. We don't have to. Students don't, aren't required to take that milk. If they want it, please, by all means, take it. But if you don't, don't take it just to throw it in the trash can. So something like that was something that we learned that was ingrained in students' heads to, to just take it, no matter what, to take their milk. So students would literally walk through the line, get to the end of the line, and throw it into the trash can before they even sat down. So preventing that will obviously have a big impact on, you know, obviously the environment, but also the budget. Okay. And I have one other question, and I'm not being critical. I'm just trying to understand this. Sure. When you mentioned three fresh fruits and three fresh vegetables, sure. are some of the, those items frozen? No. They're fresh? Yes. Thank you. If, you. if you pull up the last slide, you can see a picture of just one school that we happened to. Oh, maybe it wasn't the last. There's one. So there's, there's some fruits and all right there. Yellow squash, broccoli, carrots, uh, apples, oranges. The apple sauce is not fresh, so that one item on that, out of those selections, but that looks like a good six or seven just fruits alone. So it's kind of sort of like uh, farm to the table? That's another program. Um, this is more of the farm to, it's hard to explain. So. Farm to Table is more of a specific program where you're, you know, working with local farmers to, to use their products in the schools each day versus this is more of a permanent program across the board every single day, regardless of a promotional program. Thank you. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Ms. Dulowski? Um, thank you for everything, and I especially want to applaud that fresh fruit and vegetable program, especially with elementary school children. It sounds really wonderful. Um, I just had a quick question about the six fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe it's too early because this is relatively new, but is there any data about the percentage of students that actually eat the fresh fruits and vegetables and then any plans or strategies to try to improve the rate? Absolutely. So as part of the food waste reduction program, we collect the data of the items that are wasted. So we too early in the school year to see too much of that data yet, but we are collecting it. Um, and the idea is that just just even at the initial onset, if you're force serving a child one, you know, let's say it's broccoli. Well, I hate broccoli, but I love carrots. If I have a selection out, I'm not going to choose the broccoli because I don't I don't like it. 
So the likelihood of them actually consuming it because they were the ones that had the power to choose it, it just increases that, you know, threefold. So yes, we're, we are collecting that and adjusting as, as it goes. Sure. Thank you. So I know Dr. Hager is waiting to ask her questions. I have a, I have I knew a you were few. being too quiet over there. <laughs> I have a few as well, but if you want to, are you sure? Okay. So again, thank you for this presentation. Um, very helpful and appreciate you being here tonight. Um, we had a young man come to the board meeting not too long ago and share his feedback. And I noticed on one of your slides, you mentioned that families can help you by encouraging their students to share their, their input with teachers, with cafeteria staff. Mm -hmm. What is the best way to facilitate that? Because again, everyone's so busy. Staff are so busy during the lunch rush. I, I can't imagine that's the ideal time for them to say, I would prefer broccoli over carrots or whatever their, their feedback is. So how can they most effectively facilitate that feedback um, for you? And then the second part of my question is, can you elaborate on which food items you've replaced and what those replacements have been? And did you make those decisions based on their feedback? Sure. So first, the, the most effective way, while it's you know not necessarily what we're calling ideal, is really right then and there. Um, the goal is to have the students leave nourished and ready to learn. If they sit down and they don't like any of the food in front of them, they're going to go back to class still hungry. So we want them to immediately tell someone, whether it's the cafeteria staff, whether it's their teacher, teacher the, the teacher's assistants, and say, I don't like this or it's not the quality that I want. Whatever it might be, it doesn't matter the reason. But for us to be able to fix it immediately right there on the spot um, so that they, they can at least go right back to class and be ready to learn. Um, if that doesn't happen, you know, connect with the teacher later on. Um, all of our contact information is on the website, so anyone is always willing, always welcome to contact us directly too. So, thank you. No problem. And then, could you elaborate on which food items you've some? Give us some examples of what you've replaced and what some of those. Sure, I might. Have I might been. need to ask Joanne's help on a few of these. Some of the the ones that jump out immediately. I don't have the list in front of me. Are you know getting rid of the chocolate muffins and the you know cinnamon rolls with icing on top and chocolate muffins for breakfast and replacing those with even simple things like whole wheat or whole grain waffles and lemon bread and fresh fruits instead is, is a big a big swap out for some of those items. Um, Nacho Grande, I believe, was on the menu a while back. We got rid of that one. Um, what else have we? I don't have the list in front of me. Yeah, I think we've done, we've done a granola granola round at breakfast. Um, yeah. We um, putting yogurt on at breakfast. We're introducing hard cooked eggs in some of our boxes at oh, lunch right. as well as at breakfast. All uh, the salads. New, oh, the, new, all the new, new entree new salads. salads uh, specialty sandwiches, the bento boxes, which I think will be really popular. Mm -hmm. um, we removed the burgers. There was a burger issue for quite a while there that that's gone. Some mm -hmm. of the sandwiches, some of the photos you may have seen with the gentleman that you're speaking of, none of those items exist anymore. That's so. great. I think to meet some of the USDA guidelines, we're hearing that portions are small because of the high fat content and students, especially the secondary students, complain that in order to meet those guidelines, they're getting tiny, tiny portions of really high fat um, you know, meat stick and cheese and you know my daughter will say it's it's this big and yeah. it they're not appetizing but also not filling in not terms filling of meeting the nutritional needs so yeah the the, the serving sizes are mandated obviously um, but one thing that we we, healthier we can sources. encourage and continue to encourage is that especially at the high school level they are able to take two fruits and two vegetables um, and I think that with increasing the variety of what we're offering, that they'll actually do that, right? If we only provided them one fruit and one vegetable in the past to, to select from, and they don't like those specific items, they weren't going to take it. Versus now, if there's a larger variety, they like carrots and apples or peaches or whatever might be on the menu. So um, it's really encouraging them to be able to, to actually take all of the items that are allotted to them. We can't offer second and third slices of pizza but you can double up on those fruits and veggies all day. And salads. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Sure. Dr. Hager? I think other Ms. Joe's Oh, okay. Um, Ms. Joe's? Dr. Hager was before me, but she's, I can... 
She said you could go first. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you for this presentation. Um, I saw there were four pilot schools that were picked. What was the criteria to pick? How did you pick these schools? What was the criteria that you used? And all, all of these schools seem to be in the Northeast and Central area. That's why I'm asking that. Those four schools, we actually worked in conjunction with the sustainability department. And those four schools were already on a path of kind of internally starting some food reduction initiatives on their own. Um, so in conjunction with the composting program that was already started and the support of the sustainability initiatives, they, they were kind of already on that path. Um, they already had a very high interest. They already even had some data that we were able to start off with. So it was kind of a, I don't want to say an accident, but it, it almost fell into that those four schools were the four pilot. And that was just because of the composting program, correct? Correct. So when you're talking about providing fresh food, are those two vendor contracted services? Do we also provide non-dairy alternatives to our children? Yes, so we have the milk is the sustainable is the primary non dairy option. Oh, it, so Ripple? yes, we, we have um, Ripple, which is a pea based um, milk, and um, they can also get uh, lactate from the dairy. So we do have options for students Talk who in the mic. Um, are lactose intolerant, oh, are lactose intolerant, or um, have other reasons that they can't drink dairy uh, full dairy milk. So yes, they are available. And they're in all schools or just a few? They would because be upon request. Um, the dietitian would be working with the school nurse or the parent. Um, we would know, need to know that that child is, uh, does have a dairy allergy and we would be specializing um, their, that child's meal. And the, um, the non-dairy milk would be um, there specifically for that child if they wanted it. Anything else, Ms. Joes? No, that'd be all, thank you. Sure, Mrs. Causey. Thank you. <clears throat> I just wanted to thank our amazing staff in the Office of Food and Nutrition Services. Um, <clears throat> as we strive to achieve uh, increased academic outcomes for all of our students, we know that uh, well-roundedness and um, health is very important. And so this food and nutrition services are so important. Um, it's also an opportunity for our children to gather and socialize together. So um, we know that that's uh, very important. Um, I did want to just um, commend uh, many of our um, school advocates and members of the board and members of um, Dr. Williams staff <clears throat> where we have been able to increase the community eligibility provision. Uh, for so many schools. And on slide three, if you um, go back to that, you can see the increase um, in a short amount of time. Um, it's unfortunate that uh, we have schools, so many schools that um, meet the poverty guidelines, but it is beneficial uh, that this board and this school system is advocating for those uh, students <clears throat> by incorporating these programs. So I just appreciate that. I did also want to just understand if there, if you can outline for families and students the difference between what the requirements were last year and that uh, I believe this year our schools have greater uh, autonomy um, and flexibility with, with their um, food preparation. I'm not sure I understand the question, the, the requirements well, for... Well, now that it's not 100% funded by the USDA, um, does that provide your office with greater flexibility in uh, the variety and the, the preparation of, of food that you can offer to the children? No, so so where the funding comes from and the nutri nutritional requirements are independent of one another. So whether a school is a CEP school or last year when all meals were free nationwide, um, the, the nutritional requirements generally do not change. Um, at different points in time, there there have been flexibilities for one reason or another. But generally speaking, the funding sources and the programs that are run in different schools are really independent of the nutritional requirements that the USDA sets. 
Okay, thank you. And um, just to um, ask another question, a follow-up question. If there are students that um, do not use dairy uh, for religious or cultural reasons, uh, can they also make a request uh, through the cafeteria staff or school nurse to have those non-dairy um, beverages and choices available? Um, no, so the regulation for um, for the milk, the milk is specific to the meal and is a USDA regulation that we serve liquid dairy milk. In order for a child um, to be able to elect to have the milk that is non-dairy, um, it has to be diet related in that it has to have a health issue connected with it. Um, we um, are not required to um, provide special and alternate meals based on religion. Um, and the USDA, who regulates our program, has uh, kind of strict regulations in that all uh, diet modifications to the meal and alterations um, are backed by a, do a doctor and a diet note. Okay, thank you. And can you explain Ms. Causey, the- that's time. Oh, okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hager? <laughs> um, I am a huge fan of your work, as you know. Um, I thank you all for everything that you do. Um, I'm going to have a few quick questions, and I want to dig into CEP a little bit, just for the board, and, and have a few questions specifically for you. So share tables are not back yet? No, they're back this year. Okay, that's what I thought. Um, and I wrote down lemon bread. I've heard a lot of good things about that. Um, I'm a fan. <laughs> and the, uh, previously, we didn't serve beef products. We served turkey products, and we went back to beef during the pandemic. Are we sticking with beef? Are we going back to turkey? Or? It's pork that we didn't serve, oh, okay. not necessarily beef. So okay. No pork still? No, no. There's pork on one item, one correct? Item. The meat, meat The lovers meat pizza. pizza. <laughs> <laughs> so there's one item with pork. Everything else that we serve, even if it says it's a ham sandwich, technically turkey. Okay, I that's what I remember, then turkey dogs and things like that. Um, okay, and we, do we have meatless options every day for kids? Yes. Okay, that's what I Everything. thought as well. Um, I have seen the signage of the three versus five components in schools, which I think is really helpful for the kids. So um, I haven't seen many, much signage about the two fruits and vegetables, though. Are you promoting that in the schools? It's on the same sign as the three oh, to I five. I just missed it. I got distracted <laughs> by the three versus five. No, I totally understand. Thank you. But if you didn't see it, maybe we need a bigger yeah, sign on, on that. that I'll idea. double check next time I'm in mm -hmm. school. But yeah, I probably just was like, whoa, three versus five. This is great. Um, and so I want to dig into CEP. So could you talk a little bit about the ISP calculation and the new Medicaid um, addition this year and what you expect will happen this year? Um, so... CEP schools are determined based on their ISP, um, which is essentially their um, school-wide free and reduced population. Um, the new regulations have added Medicaid as a direct certification, which will in turn increase the ISPs in additional schools be above and beyond what we had in the past. Um, it's still too new right now. We probably just got our first batch from MSD last week, maybe. Um, it seemed to be pretty significant, <laughs> um, but we really don't know how it'll impact it yet. Um, and I, we got a message from the school system based on a question that we asked that said that uh, we would revisit in a four-year cycle, um, but from what I understand, it's more best practice to revisit your CEP numbers based on your updated ISPs annually to, to improve your... Uh, reimbursement rates and to reach all the schools that actually need help. So what is our plan? Are we doing four years or are we looking at this annually? Currently, we're on the four-year cycle plan. Is there any discussion about doing it annually? I guess there is now. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was honestly going to consider a motion tonight to, to mm -hmm. such that we would be encouraged to do this every year because I didn't realize we were on a four-year cycle until just recently. So is this... Um, you know, I don't know that it's something the board has to do, but is this something that, that you, I don't know. So, so you I think, think it would be that, beneficial to research. I think that would be a co but. bigger conversation, mm -hmm. um, Dr. Hager, as, they're, as they prepare for the opening of school, and now we have our momentum going, I think we're able to have another conversation based on your comment that we can have with Dr. Yarbrough and the team. It's going to make a big difference, I think. I think we're gonna end up with a lot more CEP eligible schools 
starting, everyone will across Maryland. It's not just us, right? So, um, and it's, it's a pretty significant policy change. And so I'm excited about it. I think it's an opportunity for our schools, a lot of those that are on the cusp of the 40%, you know? So, um, so but it, I didn't realize the four year thing until just recently. So I just wanted to ask a little bit about that given, given this big policy change. Yeah, so. I, I, like, like Dr. Williams said, I think it's definitely a thing that should be dug into a little bit deeper to, to see what the impacts are and, and what those effects are of that new, of the new regulation, so. No, that's great. Um, that's it, I made it my two minutes, so. Thank you <laughs> so much for everything that you do, seriously. This is Absolutely. great. Thank you, Dr. Hager. I have a follow-up and then Mr. McMillian's um, waiting patiently. Um, so Dr. Williams, do we know that all schools eligible for CEP for this school year are currently, or, or possibly your team, are currently enrolled for this? Or is this something we should be planning for, for um, in the FY24 budget? And is that information that the board can be provided with in terms of costs? So that's a good question. Uh, across the state, all superintendents have been talking about this. So I believe, let us have the conversation to look at all the nuances with this, um, because then we can be able to follow back up with the board about some recommendations. Okay. Thank you. Mr. McMillian? You mentioned something that, that when I was a teacher, I thought about this for years. And I was in a school building the other day, and I saw this sign that talked about the ham, that listed these things that are made out of turkey. And I don't under, and I'm not being funny, and I'm not being critical, I'm just trying to learn. If something's turkey, why don't you call it turkey? Why do you call it ham or, you know, something else? I don't understand that. Thank you. Well... Ever heard of an impossible burger? <laughs> it's not beef. <laughs> Those are vegetarian items. So there's there's a lot of products out there that are that are made from different products that satisfy the need of, you know, a special diet or different, you know, preferences and such. So with a high population in Baltimore County that does not eat pork, it's in our best interest and the best interest of the students to offer additional items that are perhaps made out of turkey and not pork. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Ms. Scott? Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to know, I heard some talk about the pilot and um, the areas where the pilot is. And I wanted to know if there were plans um, to expand the pilot. I, di I didn't know if that was already touched on. For the food waste reduction program? Um, I guess I'm thinking about for a uh, pilot for like fresh food and um, salads and things like that. So the pilot program that we talked about was for the food waste reduction program. That was last school year, and that's already been implemented ac across all schools countywide. Um, the Is there a plan to expand it, or has it come to its conclusion? Oh, that'll be ever growing as much as we can. So the initial, the initial portions of the program have been launched to all schools. Um, to me, that's step one, and then we dig into the next thing that we can make a positive impact on. And once we've done that, we'll, we'll do it again to the next item. So our goal for year one was um, geared around uh, fruit cups and milk. You know, in the next six months or maybe next year, it might be around something else as we continue with that data and make those adjustments to menus as it comes. Um, but those four pilot schools were, were something that's already complete from last year and it's already been, been launched to the whole county. But it's really okay. an ever-evolving program that will continue to grow and change organically. That was what my question is, that you just answered it, that it, it was at the Fort Pilot, and then now it had been launched already um, throughout the county. And um, I wanted to know if there was a pilot that was coming up, I guess this is my second question, um, that would include um, fresh like fruits and salad, or is that something that's already in the works? That's already launched in all schools. So the fresh fruit and vegetables for just the new program across the board to increase the fresh fruits and vegetables is already launched in every school. Um, all of the new fresh salads, I believe there's eight, eight different varieties that will rotate through the menu, the bento boxes that will rotate through the menu. That's all current. Um, that's already been launched countywide. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Hahn? 
Thank you. And thank you guys so much for this presentation, for all the work you do. I am a, I'm also a huge fan. Like I know Dr. Hager is, and I'm like, I'm over here and I'm like, this is awesome. I'm so excited for this. I know a lot of students are so excited for these amazing changes and, and being able to see themselves and their food options, but also being able to eat food that's edible. Um, I know that students were very vocal last year about their concerns. So hype and shout out to the students for sharing those opinions. Um, but I do want to ask a little bit more about um, halal and kosher options, as well as vegan and vegetarian options that are being provided, making sure that those are um, being provided in the best way possible. So, you know, step one was to add the fresh fruits and vegetables across the board. Um, the uh, wellness policy that we recently updated with Dr. Hager um, does address some of those items that we're, we're planning to work on. Um, offering kosher would be pretty tough. That, that's a pretty tough one, but maybe kosher style isn't as tough. So looking at some of those, you know, regulation states that we don't have to, um, we don't modify our menus for preferences, more for medical purposes, but that doesn't mean we can't. It doesn't mean that we can't offer, um, you know, the vegetarian options that we do offer now, e even now. All those salads that I mentioned are offered in a vegetarian way. You know, there's the, the cheese pizza versus the meat pizza. There's, there's always those different vegetarian and vegan type things that, we offer every single day. Um, it's a little tougher on those kosher type things, but you know. Um, and then also just asking in general, like I know we, we take a lot of time in curating or you guys take a lot of time in curating an amazing menu. Um, I guess student feedback in creating a menu. How does, what does that look like? What, is, what do you guys want that to look like in the future? How can we get students on board and, and helping create a menu that, that they can get behind more than just surveys? I, I mean, I think that's twofold. I think first it, it starts with that partnership of, of quality food in the cafeteria every single day. So if a student is unhappy or happy with their meal, then they should share that at, at, at any time with a teacher, with the staff, with each other across the board, just having that open line of communication each day. But the more formalized feedback is important for us to create that partnership with the students. So we you know, we go through with our dietitian and Joanne and, and all of our staff to say, okay, these are the items that we even, that will pass our first test, the, the first line of testing, but then it continues all the way down and goes to the students as well so that they can, they can be a part of that. Um, but you'll see that coming. Awesome. And then one last question. I would love to hear more about a farm to table program. Do we do that? Can, like, do some of our schools do that? I would love to hear more about that. <laughs> So we, we did a few years ago, we did a bid that um, uh, put out to the to local, uh, it's called Farm to Plate. And so we, we have partnered with several um, industries and farmers, and then COVID hit, and that became a little bit difficult. Um, so we do, um, we are trying to go local as best we can. The problem is with such a large um, population of students, that many of the farmers, if I reach out to them, will say, mm, I really can't handle your volume. But we are um, frequently, we'll purchase apples, we purchased asparagus last year, we'll get strawberries from local farmers and we'll, we'll menu them and you'll see them get advertised. Um, like farm to school week, which is in October, we're bringing in um, local mushrooms. So as best we can, we try to um, partner with the, the local farmers and producers but again, a lot of them will say that we're too large. Um, but we, we still, we we still try working with them as best we can. <coughs> awesome! Thank you guys so much. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Hager. I believe you were next. Oh, I got oh I'm so, sorry, Miss <coughs> Joes. You were next. Uh, <coughs> Thank you. Um, when I spoke to the previous Ms. Levin's team before she left, one of the issues we had at breakfast was, and you kind of addressed that, a lot of sugary um, items and making it high protein was something that was an issue, even putting boiled eggs because they would go gray. Was that an issue that was ever resolved in providing more protein during breakfast? Um, we removed a lot of those sugary items. We removed the chocolate muffins and the donuts and the ice cinnamon rolls, the, you know, cereal, the, uh, 
what were they? Tricks, trick cereal bars and such. Um, so we, we removed a lot of those items. Um, there are proteins in several items, though. We have the uh, turkey, no, I'm sorry, pancake wrapped sausage. Um, we just brought in the hard cooked eggs to add those to the menu. Um, yes, uh, unfortunately, yeah, the regulations, of... um, the USDA regulation does not concentrate on protein at breakfast at all. It mainly concentrates on the grains and the carbohydrates. So we try to introduce um, the protein when we can. So we are introducing yogurt at breakfast and, and we see a hard cooked egg and the hot entrees uh, for the most part have um, protein in them. There might be a, um, an, an egg and cheese um, sausage sandwich on a croissant. Um, but yeah, the, the, unfortunately the regulation does not concentrate on the proteins it more on the carbohydrates, greens. Thank you. Well, we were at the NSBA conference. There were a lot of vendors that were providing fresh food, salads, uh, quinoa salads, and uh, granola bars that were fresh made. Is there anything in the works with BCPS to do something like that at a few schools with a much more robust, healthy um, diet that follows USDA guidelines but is uh, fresh and prepared on premise? And I know it's not possible with a large system, but something in the works to pilot a strategic uh, way, something that's innovative. Do you do you have anything in the plans? Is there any discussion on that? I mean, I think in general, the, the menu is ever evolving all the time. We, we attend food shows, we remain in contact with our vendors on a consistent basis. So when we come across products, we test them, we put them through, you know, the whole rigmarole that, that that goes through our, our internal checks to see if something is going to make it to the end. And then we get with the students and, and see if they like it as well. Um, for right now, you know, I've, I've shared the things that we've done, which is quite a bit. We, we took off a, a ton of the sugary items and we added a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables, which was a huge win, um, especially in the breakfast arena. So, um, you know, the menu is definitely ever changing and there's definitely always a room for growth and opportunity. Um, so nothing's off the table, but but I think we've made a lot of progress already so far. Thank you. Dr. Hager? Um, I just want to mention child nutrition reauthorization is coming up, and hopefully they will address added sugar and protein and breakfast and all those things we're talking about at the federal level. And tomorrow is the White House meeting on hunger and nutrition and health, and so we may hear more tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So um, lots of good things on the horizon. The question I wanted to ask about were the lines, the, the wait time to get food. And I know that that's been an ongoing struggle again nationwide. And we've done a lot with kind of the point of service machines and kind of speeding that up. Is, is there anything, are you working on anything on that front now in this launch room? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've done a lot. The HR department is, is moving mountains right now with staffing and recruiting to, to get all the school staffed. We're, we're still significantly understaffed, as is the rest of the nation, and especially in food service just the same as teachers and buses and such. So the, those lines are, are something that we're working on, but um, our HR is, <laughs> they're, they're working really, really hard, but um, it's, it's a tough environment right now. Yeah, I know that is definitely one thing you hear is my, I can't wait, it's so long. You know, and I know it again, it's, it's national, it's not. It's yeah, just, they need to get back to class. You know, yeah. we understand that. So we're trying our best to speed up the service methods. We've changed some of the, we've even changed menu items that just took physically too long to serve. So if we were able to drop five seconds off of each student, then that, that adds up at the end of the day. So there are different things that we've done up to this point. Um, you know, we, we implemented an entire new POS system, you know, this year after the ransomware attack. So uh, there's, there's definitely some room for improvement there. Um, we're hiring. If anyone is looking <laughs> for a job, <laughs> please let me know. Yeah, no, that, that you guys are doing great work. I just I wanted to highlight some of the things that I knew that you were doing. So that's really, really good to hear. Thank you. Thank you. And our last question goes to Mr. My Italian. last question. <laughs> the next time I'm in, a, I'm in a school building, can I stop down a cafeteria and check out a bento box? <laughs> Absolutely. They start... A week and a half, maybe, on is the first on next on Wednesday. Wednesdays. You have to be I want to do that. To roll it on Wednesdays. I'm going to tell them you said it was okay. <laughs> you do that. Thank much. you. Thank you. Dr. Williams. So uh, good evening, word. everyone. I do want to acknowledge our cafeteria workers, our cafeteria managers and our lunchroom assistants. They do a fabulous job each and every day working with 
thousands of students. I do want to acknowledge Jamie, Terry, and Joanne for being here and the work that you have done. I just want to echo the changes that you've made um, to prepare us for this year. We greatly appreciate that. As you well know, I visit schools and I have been eating our lunch um, and I appreciate the choices and our cafeteria workers will remind students about the fruits and vegetables, even if the students don't read the sign. They do do a nice job of working with the students, not only on their choices, but also their pin numbers. So thank you so much. I got a pin number. And the best thing I hear <laughs> is what the kids like, uh, Roa. They like the lemon bread. They like the banana nut bread. And I tasted the hummus and vegetables. So kudos to the work and the upgrades that you've done thus far. So I do want to commend you and all of our cafeteria workers, managers, and assistants, board members, go and visit a school and have lunch with students and enjoy our food that we provide. Or bring your own. You have that option as well. <laughs> but I want to thank you all for being here tonight and giving an update. Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda is information items, which include the revised superintendent's rule 5120 and the 2021-2022 summer graduation and projected graduation rate report. The next item on the agenda is board committee updates and agenda setting. First is committee updates. The links to the September committee meetings can be found on board docs under this agenda item. First, we have the audit committee. Mr. McMillian. Great. I'm extremely happy to uh, the fact that the internal uh, audit plan was, uh, internal audit work plan was passed this evening. So we can move forward with that. They've been working on it. Our next meeting is Tuesday. It's the third Tuesday of the month in October, October 18th from 4.30 to 6 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Budget committee, Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Hen. The Budget Committee uh, meeting, uh, met on uh, September 21st, <clears throat> discussing the impact of uh, teacher salaries on the budget going forward and possible um, um, increases uh, in salary and COLAs. Um, this has basically been overcome by uh, situations that occurred today and agreements that have been made with uh, the county executive that were discussed. Um, so uh, we plan on meeting uh, next month, um, I believe on the 19th, but I'll have to check that. The information's available on the website. Thank you. Thank you. Curriculum committee, Mr. Offerman. The next curriculum committee meeting will be Thursday, October 20th at 2.30. Thank you. Equity Committee and Equity Committee with Equity Council, Ms. Scott. Uh, yes, we had a Equity Committee meeting, but due to lack of a quorum, uh, due to absence of board members, the Equity Committee unfortunately was not able to meet. And the next Equity Committee meeting is scheduled for October 20th. So I would ask that equity committee members who are intent on staying on the committee um, make a note of that date. Thank you. Thank you. Legislative and governmental relations, Ms. Causey. Good evening, thank you. Um, I just wanted to state that um, currently the legislative and re uh, government relations committee uh, does not have a meeting scheduled, um, but I've uh, requested <clears throat> from staff if we can um, start the process for scheduling it because the uh, cycle is going to start soon and the Maryland Association Boards of Education Conference, which uh, Dr. Williams and uh, several board members will be attending, does have its first legislative committee meeting uh, in October, the first week of October. So. There's a lot of good work that started last year that we want to continue. So, uh, can look for an email soon. 
Okay, thank you. Last, we have the Policy Review Committee. The Policy Review Committee met on September um, 19th. The next meeting is October 17th. Next is board member comments and agenda items for future board meetings. And we'll start with Mrs. Causey. Mrs. Causey, anything for board member comments or agenda items? Okay, Ms. Delusky? No, nope, I don't have anything specifically. Just enjoyed all of the presentations and all of the good that is happening so far. Ms. Joes? Thank you, yes. I would like to add to the next board meeting, October 11th, uh, the equity metrics update that was supposed to be presented at the last equity meeting. Um, since it was canceled, I think it's a good idea for this to come to the full board since we have more than half of the board on the committee, six members out of 11. Uh, so I'd really like to add that and um, to the October 11th agenda. Thank, Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Mr. McMillian? I'd like to commend staff on the way that they handled the Pine Grove situation. You know, everybody I talked to says that it was an outstanding job. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Hahn? Thank you. And a huge, 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 huge shout out to everyone here today, everyone who has, you know, served Baltimore County, everyone who has made this school year an amazing one thus far. Um, I know I, I personally, um, I, you know, I'm, commending all of my teachers who are in the building um, and everyone I've encountered thus far. So a huge shout out and, and definitely an immense shout out to Pine Grove, um, to the students there. I know I can't even imagine how much fear and, and trauma that must have been. So um, thank you to the teachers, administration, staff who who made sure that, that they were communicating with their students. And, and a huge, just all of my hearts go out to that community um, and, and every single community experiencing um, issues with school safety right now. And I, I really hope to, to be able to continue to push that um, in the coming months. And I guess, I mean, the only thing I can say is let's get in good trouble one last time. Mr. Offerman? I have no suggestions for the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Scott? Thank you. Yes. Um, I would like as well to see the equity presentation, the equity audit that was supposed to be at the equity committee meeting. Um, and that was unfortunately not able to be shared due to lack of a quorum. Uh, the document basically shows, which is also in board docs, um, three years of data that shows where there are persistent gaps and widening gaps for the most recent school year for our students in the areas of map, reading benchmarks. And this is important information as we do educational equity and we work to support all of our students. These are the questions that we need to ask that are being answered that we as a board need to know so that we can affect change. So I think that's important and I hope it is for consideration on the October 11th agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hager. Um, I, I also want to echo uh, the remarks of Ms. Jost and, and uh, Ms. Scott regarding the inclusion of the equity audit. Uh, we've been waiting for it for a while, and now that it's here, it would be great to discuss it sooner rather than later. Um, and I want to thank um, Ms. Senator Mr. McMillian for including the food nutrition services on the agenda, which I had asked for in the past, and um, echo that they are willing to hear feedback and want to hear feedback, and please, um, you know, for others to, to, to provide that feedback to them so that they can just make things better. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> uh, for a future meeting, I would like to discuss the, uh, the fact that high school starts too early in the morning and that uh, we need to adjust the schedule appropriately. Um, this has happened in multiple districts across the country and it has an effect on our teenagers uh, and their lack of sleep. 
Uh, so I definitely would like to have that added. If not, I'll be bringing a motion to ask for a report going forward uh, to move our um, our system uh, closer to making high school start later. Uh, regarding my comments, I, I, I know that right now uh, the seniors out there and their parents are all scrambling to get their applications together for college. Uh, we're only a month into um, into school, probably just about a full month, uh, but uh, a, a lot of colleges require early application if you're going to um, have a shot at any kind of merit scholarship aid. So um, I just want to tell everybody to take a deep breath and uh, to continue the good work that you're doing and, uh, and best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. And lastly, I just want to thank um, Dr. Williams, my colleagues on the board, Mr. Hartlove, and all of our staff for our commitment to Team BCPS and our work to compensate and reward and recognize our staff appropriately. This is a win. It's a step in the right direction. Um, but I recognize the arduous efforts that went into getting us to where we are. And I appreciate all of your efforts. And I appreciate the county executive and county councils. Um, cooperation and appreciate that we, we, were, we were able to reach an agreement um, for the good of our students and for our team. Um, so I appreciate that and everyone's Ms. efforts. Ms. Kalsi has an agenda item. She wasn't on the line okay. at the time. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. She can submit that in writing. Okay. The last item on the agenda is announcements. The board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, October 11th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. Thank you all very much for joining us tonight. Have safe travel home. The meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>